If you have your Bibles, turn to John 18.10, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to pray while you're turning there. Dear Father, thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here today and worship you, and we pray now that you'd bless our worship as we look into your word. Father, I pray you give me the words to speak, the strength to speak them, and I pray, Father, you'd open our hearts to hear just what you'd have for us today. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So... Let's continue to where we left off, kind of looking in the Gospel of John. Jesus and his, and his disciples were in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was nighttime. Jesus had been praying to the Father. And then the mob, with their swords and their clubs and their lanterns, showed up. And this mob was led by Judas Iscariot, the former disciple of Jesus, who was now a traitor. Indeed, though he was a formal disciple of Jesus, outwardly, he, he, he was never a true disciple of Jesus, inwardly. Jesus actually said this about Judas. John six seventy. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you are a devil? One of you is a devil. Now this wicked mob shows up to arrest Jesus, and here's what happens next. Follow along with me, John eighteen ten. Simon Peter then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Peter, the impulsive Peter, draws his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's slave. Peter was not about to let this mob arrest Jesus without a fight. But listen to what Jesus says and does next. And I go over to Luke for this. You don't have to turn there. But Luke twenty two fifty one says, But Jesus answered and said, Stop. No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. So Jesus shut down this violence. And he healed the slave's ears. And then they arrested Jesus. Well, let's keep going and see what happens next. Verse 12, so the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl, who kept the door, said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know, not, they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas, so Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Peter, the strong disciple, you could say, the leader of the disciples, denied Jesus. Denied that he even knew Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And this is a fearful thought. If Peter can deny Jesus, what about us? And so this morning, while there's a lot in this whole account, I want to zero right in on Peter's denial. So let's look at this closely and just see what we can learn from Peter's denial of the Lord. 
specifically. Let's look at four truths that we can learn from Peter's denial of Jesus. Let me list them, and then we're going to look at each one. For those of you, of you who like to write things down or however you want to do it, number one, Satan can't touch a Christian without God's permission. Number one, Satan can't touch a Christian without God's permission. Number two, we aren't as strong as we think we are. We aren't as strong as we think we are. Number three, God will bring us through trials to show us our weakness. God will bring us through trials to show us our weakness. And number four, God is merciful. God is merciful. So let's look at the first point. The first point is, Satan can't touch a Christian without God's permission. There's more to this account than we see at first glance. A few hours earlier, when Jesus and his disciples were gathered to eat the Lord's Supper, before they went out to the garden, when they were in that room, Jesus said this to Peter, who was also called Simon. He said this, Luke twenty-two thirty-one, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. The Bible says that Satan had gone to the Lord and he demanded permission to sift Peter like wheat. In other words, he wanted to shake Peter up. He wanted to put him through a severe trial and cause him to fall if he could. But this raises a question. If Satan wanted to put Peter through a trial... Why didn't he just do it? Ever thought about that? If Satan wanted to put Peter through a trial, why didn't he just do it? Why did he ask the Lord for permission? In fact, why did he demand permission? He didn't just ask. The Bible says he demanded permission. He demanded permission most likely because he had probably asked for permission to put Peter through trials before probably many times. We don't know this for sure. But he probably did. And so this time he doesn't just ask. He demands. And the Lord could say no whether Satan asked or demanded. The Lord's in control. But in this case, the Lord didn't say no. He gives Satan permission to sift Peter like wheat. What do we learn from this? We learn that Satan can't just go up to one of the Lord's disciples, one of the Lord's followers, and do as he pleases. We learn that Satan can't just go up to a Christian and make trouble. Now to you, some of this might sound a little bit different than what you're used to, so please listen closely. We learn that Satan can't just go up to a Christian and make trouble. He has to have God's permission. Surely Uh, Satan wanted to tempt Peter, to put him through trials, to torment him, to cause him to fail, to cause him to backslide, to fall. But before he could do anything at all, he had to ask permission of the Lord. And it makes you wonder, how many times had the devil asked permission to go after Peter prior to this? And how many times had the Lord said no? We don't know. And it makes me wonder, How many times has the enemy asked permission from the Lord to sift you or to sift me? And how many times has the Lord said no? For all we know, this might really sound different, but please keep keep following what I'm going to say. For all we know, maybe many, many of us have never been sifted by Satan ever. Maybe God has always said no. I doubt if the Lord gives them permission very often. I really do. Now let me show you another verse that teaches us the same thing, that Satan can't even touch us without God's permission. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John 5.18. And this is one of those verses in my Bible that's underlined. 1 John 5.18. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, and some of this this may be new to you. 1 John 5.18. It says, we know that no one who was born of God sins, but he who was born of God, that's Jesus, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Listen to the same verse from the New Living Translation. 
it's just a little clearer. 1 John 5, 18, New Living Translation. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. How many times have you read that verse and not caught what it says? You know how you read through the Bible, and you get through a whole section, and if someone asked you two minutes later, what did you just read? And you might say, you know, I don't know. Isn't that true? You're better off going slow and really paying attention. This is one of those verses we go over too easily. It says, God's son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. Christian, whatever you think about the enemy, know this. He might go about roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, as it says in 1 John 5, 8, but he certainly can't devour a Christian. He can't even touch a Christian without explicit permission from the Lord. When Satan went after Job and killed his cattle, and killed his children, and afflicted him with boils, and took away his health. It was Satan who did this, but Job never once credited Satan with doing these calamities. Not once. And you know why? Because he knew that these trials were ultimately, ultimately from God. Job 2.10, Job's talking to his wife, and he says in Job 2.10, But Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Job knew that good things and bad came from God. Satan might be the instrument that God uses, but God is in control. Satan couldn't touch Job without God's permission. And Job knew whatever happened to him, whatever happened to him, God had a plan a plan for good, and he knew that whatever happened, no matter how bad, that God was going to save him in the end. Satan could not thwart any of God's plans for Job. Job even said this, in the midst of all the trouble he was going through, Job 19.25, he says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take the stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I, I shall see God whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another, my heart faints within me. The Lord restored restored all that Job lost, and, and he saved him in the end. So Christian, know this. When good things happen and when bad things happen, God is in control completely, not Satan. And God only allows things in our lives that will ultimately do us good, and bring him glory. So be like Job. Don't give Satan credit when bad things happen. Even if God was using Satan as the instrument, don't give Satan credit. Don't give him glory. And don't blame Satan for the sin in your life. We sin because we're sinners. We get tempted because we still have evil desires in our heart. Even if you have bad thoughts, Don't blame Satan. This might sound different to you, but there is not a verse in the Bible that says that Satan can put thoughts in our heads. Not one. Indeed, the Bible says he cannot touch us. Take responsibility for your own bad thoughts. The idea of Satan whispering into your head, this is more of a pagan superstition than anything biblical. Now, it's possible that Satan may be doing something to tempt you or harass you, but he isn't omnipresent. He isn't everywhere. It's just as possible that he's never done anything to you ever. Knowing that he can only be at one place at one time and there's over six billion people in this world, what are actually the odds? And if he has brought a trial into your life, he had to get God's permission first. And God will give him permission only, only if it serves God's purposes and does you good. And so the first point is, Satan can't touch a Christian without God's permission. In the case of Peter, God gave permission for Satan to sift Peter like wheat, and it was for Peter's ultimate good and God's glory. Now, I got a feeling that first point raised a lot of questions with a lot of people. So let me just give you one more thing. If you want to if you want to know about spiritual warfare, I'd encourage you to get a book. It's a used book. It's out of print, but you can still get it on Amazon. 
It's called Power Encounters by David Paulison. I'd really encourage you to get that book. And you can take all your other spiritual warfare books for the most part and just throw them away. So many of them, I better stop. I'm going to go on a rabbit trail that I don't mean to go on. There's just a lot of bad teaching out there on spiritual warfare, okay? Satan's given way too much credit. He's glorified way too much. Christian, Satan cannot touch you without God's permission. David Paulison, P-O-W-L-I-S-O-N, David Paulison, Power Encounters. All right, point number two. The second truth we learn from this account, we aren't as strong as we think we are. Peter thought he was pretty strong spiritually. He loved the Lord. He had followed him for the past three years faithfully. And now he thought that he was strong enough to follow him, even to the point of being imprisoned, or even to the point of being put to death. He had a confidence in his spiritual strength. We know this because of what he said. Listen to what Jesus said to Peter. Now this is Luke 22, 31. We just read this verse. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan's demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when you once have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now listen to what Peter says back to the Lord. But he said to him, Lord, with you, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. So Peter says, I'll go to prison. I'll even be put to death. And I'm sure that Peter meant it. I really believe he meant it. But when the trial actually came, what happened? John 18, 17, then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. So Peter was confronted by a slave girl. This, this slave girl looks at Peter closely, and, and, and she just says, are you one of these disciples? You are, aren't you? And you would expect Peter to say with confidence, yes, I am. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he, instead he says, I'm not. Now when Peter said, I am not, he must have felt his own words just cut through him like a knife. He, he was probably both afraid of being found out as a disciple and yet thinking, how, how could I deny my Lord? And then just a little while later, the slaves and the officers were warming themselves in that cool evening by a charcoal fire. And this happened. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And one of the slaves of the high priest being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Earlier that very night, Peter had said, I'm willing to go to prison, Lord. I'm willing to die for you, Lord. And now just a short time later, Jesus is arrested, and Peter denies the Lord. Not once, not twice, but three times. Peter, who thought he was strong, when asked by a little slave girl, are you a disciple of Jesus? Says, I'm not. What does this teach us? It teaches us that like Peter, we may be confident. We may think we're strong spiritually. We may think we would never turn away from the Lord or deny him. We may think that we will stand strong in the midst of a trial. But in the end, if Peter could deny Jesus, so could I, so could you. If, if Peter can fail in the midst of a trial, so could I, so could you. If Peter could fall, we all could fall, every one of us. We aren't strong in ourselves. We're actually pretty weak. We need the Lord to give us strength in the midst of our trials. Otherwise, like Peter, we might fall even if we think we won't. And so when you're tempted, when you're in the midst of a trial, don't go it alone. Ask the Lord, turn to the Lord, pray to the Lord to give you the strength that you don't have the strength that you need right at that moment to get through it. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Notice it doesn't say, I can do all things and stop. It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If Peter, who was truly a great disciple of Jesus, can, can deny the Lord, so could you and I. We're pretty weak. Let's go to the third point. God will bring us through trials to show us our weakness. You ever thought of that about, about that before? Even as Christians, we still have this sinful flesh. We struggle with sin every day. 
And one of the sins that we deal with very commonly is pride. We think too much of ourselves. And in our pride, like Peter, we sometimes think that we're strong. We, we get self-reliant. We think we can stand on our own. The last point we covered was we aren't as strong as we think we are. But here's another problem that we have. Not only are we not as strong as we think we are, sometimes we have to be shown that we aren't as strong as we think we are. God will bring us through trials just to show us our weakness. If things always go well, if they always go smoothly, we tend to forget the Lord. We forget that we need him. We forget that we're dependent on him. We think we can stand on our own. When things always go smoothly, we tend to pray less. We tend to read the Bible less. We get careless because we think we're strong. We have confidence in our ability to stand on our own. Things are going smoothly, and we think, I must be doing a pretty good job. And when we get like that, God will sometimes bring a trial just to remind us that on our own we're weak and that we need him. Sometimes God will bring us through something to show us our weakness. The Lord must have thought that Peter needed to be shown that he was weak on his own. And so when Satan demanded to sift Peter, the Lord allowed it. And sure enough, Peter failed. The Lord knew that on his own Peter was weak, but Peter didn't know it. And it was after Peter denied Christ three times that Peter now knew he was weak on his own. Christian, have you ever fallen into some sin that you never thought you would fall into? Have you ever gone back to some sin that you thought you had conquered? Why did you fall? Why did you backslide? Well, one reason is for sure you aren't as strong as you thought you were. Neither am I. But have you ever considered that perhaps you haven't fallen into some certain sin or you haven't backslidden into some sin because the Lord has been holding you back from that sin? Have you ever considered that? Have you ever considered that sometimes when we think we're strong and we think we would never fall and we think we would never backslide, have you ever considered that it is the Lord all this time keeping us from falling keeping us from backsliding. When we get too proud, when we get too self-righteous, when we get too big for our britches, when we think we're strong on our own, that's when we're likely to fall. Have you ever considered that the Lord might sometimes just pull back his grace a little bit? And he does it because he loves you. He might pull back his grace just a little bit. When he does, then we fall. And then we see for ourselves that we're weak and we need the Lord. It's true, isn't it? We are weak spiritually on our own, but sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes the Lord knows that we don't see it. And we stop relying on him. And the Lord just pulls his grace back just a little bit. Sometimes he might let Satan sift us just a little bit, like he did with Peter. And then we fall. You know what the Lord said? The Lord said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The third point was God will bring us through trials sometimes just to show us our weakness. Just to turn us back to him. Fourth point, last point. God is merciful. Peter denied that he even knew the Lord. When asked if he was a disciple of Jesus, he said vehemently, I am not. And he did this not once, not twice, but three times. And after reading this account in the Bible, you might think, for Peter, it's over. You might think, the Lord's done with Peter. If you stopped right there and at the end of this account, you might think, the Lord's done with this guy. But listen to what happened. After Jesus died and rose from the dead, he made several appearances to the disciples. One morning, after Peter and some of the disciples had been fishing, they met the Lord on the shore, and they all ate breakfast together and listened to what Jesus said to Peter. This is in John 21, 15. There they are sitting on the shore. They got a little fire. It's crackling away. They're eating some fish. John 21, 15 says, So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. That is so wonderful. Jesus didn't cast Peter out. Not at all. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And so now the Lord questions Peter three times. Do you love me? And he questioned Peter three times so that Peter could affirm his love to Jesus three times. It was as if Jesus was undoing those three denials for Peter by having Peter say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Three times. And then after each time Peter said, I love you, Jesus told him, shepherd my sheep, tend my lambs. In other words, Jesus not only undid Peter's denials, but he recommissioned him to get back to the business of doing the Lord's work. Praise God for that, amen? Amen. Christian, we are weak on our own. Sometimes God even causes trials so that we we will see our weakness because we need to see it. But know this, Satan cannot touch us without God's permission. And when we do fall, which we will, God loves us and he's merciful. The Lord will not cast you out. He will forgive you and restore you and tell you to get back to the Lord's work. Amen? Amen. As he did with Peter. Thank God for his mercy. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for showing us the Apostle Peter's weakness because, Lord, we sure can identify with him. Lord, we're weak. And sometimes we think we're strong, but we know, we know we're weak. We thank you, Lord, that you protect us from Satan. We thank you, Lord, that he can't touch us without your permission. We thank you, Lord, that when we do fail, when we do fall, you still love us and you restore us. We thank you for your great mercy. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.